Well, uh, please turn with me uh, to Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, we're just concentrating on one particular verse uh, this evening. It's verse uh, 18, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, where Paul says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And so, by way of introduction, just one word, and it's that word inheritance that we find in our text, uh, Ephesians 1 verse 18, where Paul is saying there, uh, the eyes of your understanding being Enlight, uh, being enlightened. Actually, the, Hebrew, uh, the Greek actually says, the eyes of your heart being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of the calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance, as Jesus' inheritance in uh, the saints. Uh, Paul is writing to this church at Ephesus, as you know, and uh, we've been looking from verse 15 that he is praying for the church, and uh, in those verses, verses 15, 16, 17, uh, we've discovered that he has been praying without ceasing. Whenever he comes to prayer, he thinks about this church and he prays for the church. And last Sunday evening, we were thinking in terms of him praying, uh, a Trinitarian praying, uh, prayer, praying in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But uh, this evening, what is the very first thing that he prays for them? Well, it's there in verse 18. He begins his prayer, doesn't he? Uh, he says in verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that may give you uh, the Spirit, and we thought there last Sunday evening, of the Holy Spirit, of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And what is the knowledge that they should have? Well, that, that the eyes of their understanding, the eyes of their hearts, being enlightened, that they may have a revelation, they may see the depth, that they may know what is the hope of his calling, why Christ came into the world, what Christ has done, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in uh, the saints. And it's this inheritance in the saints is what we're going to be thinking of um, this evening. So, our first point, what is the inheritance that we find in Ephesians 1, verse 18? Well, it is this. We are his inheritance. We who are going to go to heaven. It is heaven that is the inheritance of Jesus. A heaven that is open to all who believe in the Lord Jesus. Uh, the, the reference there refers to the, the glory of his, of his inheritance in the saints. And uh, don't think of all the sort of Catholic saints you can think of. The word there, saints, uh, it can it translate it into, into Greek, really, would just simply be holy ones. And the holy ones are simply those people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So as I look around and as I see people and I know that they have their profession and confession of the Lord Jesus Christ here, then you're saints and you're part of the inheritance that Jesus has and that part of that inheritance that Jesus has is that the saints, the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ will be with him in heaven. We belong to God and we belong to Jesus and Jesus is the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. And the sheep have been given to Jesus. So if we go to John chapter 10, for example, and verses 14 to 16, Jesus says in that portion, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, these are the world, those who are yet to come and become believers in Jesus, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. 
And so if you think of it like this, we're, sh we're the sheep of Jesus, and Jesus is our good shepherd. And those sheep will be with Jesus in heaven. And John 14, excuse me, I've got a bit of a nitty nose this morning, this evening. John 14, verse 3 says this. Jesus' words to his disciples, but they're words to us who are his disciples today. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, says Jesus, and receive you to myself, that where I am, where's Jesus? He's in heaven. And where I am, there you may be also. But I want to suggest to you that it's a very strange thing that happens to Christians. Although all that we said is true, how often do we meditate upon heaven? How often do we think about heaven? How often do we think of the inheritance that is Jesus in having us to be with him in glory in heaven? You see, when we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we may come, uh, uh, first come to faith, we might think of heaven quite a lot. This is a, a place that is open to us. This is a place that is ours now. Uh, and we're part of the, the, the citizens of heaven. And we're going to be with Jesus forever and ever. But how quickly the thoughts of heaven disappear in the busyness of life, uh, the busyness of church sometimes. Uh, uh, and we, we don't often think about heaven. We don't often meditate upon heaven. Because so often we want to live in the present. And sometimes, this may happen in church sometimes. We may talk about heaven. We may talk about uh, what happens when you die. Uh, especially if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And people will say to us, you know, there's no need to talk about that yet. And the reality of heaven, that, that place where we are going to be, is often put in a section in our brains which says something like this. It's the not yet section. So we don't need to think about it. We don't need to meditate upon it until there comes a time when heaven becomes, and, and our lives uh, and the, uh, our life passing away becomes more real. But if we do that, if we're not thinking and meditating, uh, not taking and not talking of heaven, I suggest to you we miss out on a great deal of blessing from God. Because God wants us to be not only thinking in the present, but also to be longing and looking for the future blessing, the inheritance that we have in Christ in glory. I'm going to make a little, little uh, book uh, plug here at this point. Uh, there's a man called Jonathan Edwards. He's often considered to be probably, probably the last of the Puritans. He was uh, an 18th century uh, preacher, a pastor of New England in those days. And he preached a number of sermons on 1 Corinthians 13. And you've got two copies of that book in the library, and it's called Charity and His Fruits. And the, probably the last sermon of that book, the last sermon that he preached on 1 Corinthians 13, is probably the best. And uh, its title is Heaven, A World of Love. And he's using the very last verse of that 1 Corinthians 13 uh, as, as the basis of his sermon. You know, uh, about um, love, was it faith, hope, and charity? I've got that one right. And the greatest of these is love. And the greatest of these is love. And his, that's his sermon. He's preaching that. But one of the things he does do in the book, and especially in that sermon, is he chides his readers, he chides his original listeners about not thinking more about heaven. And I think that's probably true about us as well, isn't it? We don't think about heaven as much as we do. And if we did, well, it would be a great motivation to us in serving the Lord and loving the Lord. So we need to ask the question perhaps to ourselves, why are we not meditating on heaven and eternal life? Well, I want to give four things, four things to say uh, this evening about heaven. So the numbering of, uh, of the sermon is a bit strange, so don't get uh, caught up with that. But it, the first thing I want to say is this, 
is that it is a world, it is a world of comfort. It is a world of comfort. You know, in the midst of the trials and troubles of the life in which we live, and every single one of us will have trials and troubles. And if you say, well, I haven't got any trials, and I haven't got any troubles, well, I've got news for you. You soon, you soon will have trials and troubles in life because that's part of living on planet Earth, isn't it? That's part of being a human being. We, we have our trials and our troubles. But there's a comfort in knowing that there's a place for God's people, for those who love Jesus, where there's a perfect, uh, a perfect peace in eternity. There's a perfect comfort in eternity. There's a perfect place where there will be no trials and no troubles and no difficulties. And the comfort is in a number of ways. And one of the first things, of course, the comfort that we can have is that is knowing who is there. Who is in heaven? Well, Jesus is in heaven, isn't he? Our, our glorious Lord, our wonderful King, our Redeemer, uh, the perfect Saviour that he is, the precious one. You can think of all the adjectives if you, that you can if you want to, to think about Jesus and all that we can imagine about Jesus, gentle Jesus, who uh, was the friend of sinners, who came alongside those in, who were uh, uh, tax collectors and prostitutes and all those, as we read about in the Gospels. He there, the one who loved us so much that he gave his life to die on that cross for us, taking upon himself all our sins paying the price for all our sins and giving to us that righteousness, his perfect righteousness, so that we can come before his Father in heaven, the holy God, clothed in his righteousness, pleading the blood of Christ that cleanses from all sin. He's there. That's something to meditate upon, isn't it? That's something to reflect upon. Who else is there? Well, all the believers in Jesus who have gone on before us. Have you someone in your family, someone you know about who knows and loves the Lord Jesus Christ, who has, who has died in faith, believing in the Lord Jesus? Well, they're there. And you can perhaps uh, in your own mind picture uh, the great choir of, of heaven, uh, angels and men praising God. And when God calls us to be with himself in heaven, we'll be there. We'll be joining that choir of of. Uh, Wonderful voices praising the, praising the Lord. And it is our eternal home. And Jesus has promised us this, hasn't he? He's promised that comfort of knowing that this place in which we live, this, this earth, this life that we have, is not all that there is. Isn't it like one of the sadnesses of those who say there's no God? That all they can think of is that this life that they they're living is the only life that they have, and life full of trials and troubles and pain and suffering, and and then death. Well, Jesus has another view to that. This is what he says uh, to his uh, disciples. What he says to us: Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and, re and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's a world of comfort. But it is also a world without sin. It's a world without sin. There's no sin in heaven. Heaven is that perfect place where God is. I wonder, I wonder this evening if you're feeling plagued by sin. I know that I am, um, and I'll tell you why in a moment, but there's a sense in which we can be plagued with sin. Uh, uh, sins that are our own. The way that we've let the Lord down. 
the way that we wanted to be a great Christian, a better Christian, but we've fallen flat on our faces. We've sinned again, and we've had to come and confess before God again. Lord, I've messed up once more. And uh, Lord, uh, I know that I, my sins have been paid for, but forgive me for messing up uh, uh, once more. And we can be plagued with the, 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 the sins and the, tri- uh, and the trespasses and uh, all the bad things. We, we know we're not the people that we should be. And perhaps we can look at ourselves and we can look at our brothers and sisters in Christ and think, well, we're, we're not worthy. Not like some of them. Not like them. <laughs> you seem more holy and more godly and seem to know the Bible so much and there's me. Well, what does, what does Paul say? Well, he says this in Romans 7 and verse 24 to 25. Oh, wretched man that I am. Can you imagine that? You think of Paul, you think, well, there weren't too many Christians better than Paul, but he can get plagued by sin as well, can't he? Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Well, what's his answer? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. <coughs> our Lord. So then with my mind, I, uh, I myself serve the Lord of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He's got that, that, that conflict in him. He wants to be a faithful servant to Jesus. But so often, he stumbles and he falls. But then, are we not all the man of Romans 7? Paul certainly thinks of himself like that. In Romans chapter 7 and uh, verse 19, he says this, For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. And perhaps we've all had that experience. We don't, we, we want to be those good, God-honoring servants of the Lord Jesus. But we trip over. And we chide ourselves and rebuke ourselves. But then, also, there's the sin of others. We live in a fallen world and we're surrounded by sinners and we're sinners as well. And we can be sinned against. People tell us that they'll be there for us. But when the problem comes, when the trouble comes, they're not there for us. People might give their promises and break their promises. And then there's the sin that is in the world. You know, when I was talking about being plagued with sin, it's not just my sin. And it might not be the sins of, of those whom I love and all that are, that are around me, but it's the, it's the sin of the world. Isn't it? It's it's you see the news broadcast and what are what are you finding? You're finding wars, aren't you? You're finding people warring against other people, human beings killing other human beings. You find violence, you find hatred, you find acts of gross wickedness in the world. It's almost got to the point that you don't want to put on the television and hear the news because there's so much that is that is evil and wicked and terrible. And you can get plagued by it, can't you? And the Lord Jesus Christ told us that this was going to be so. There would be wars. There would be rumors of wars. And Jesus said that will happen until he comes. So I've got a text, but I'm not going to throw up, so I'm going to move on. And to another point, and is this, it's a world of peace. Heaven is a world of peace. It's a place of peace because Jesus is the prince of peace. Now, on earth, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I hope and I pray that although we might have conflicts and trials and troubles, we can face those conflicts and trials and troubles with a kind of peace. Paul, Paul put it like this, the peace of God which passes all understanding. I don't know about you, but there sometimes there are such anxieties and problems that come our way, but deep down inside, 
there's that peace. That peace that says, you're a child of God. You belong to Jesus. You're going to heaven. This isn't this, this, this problem, this difficulty, this trial, it isn't all that that is. There's something wonderful waiting for you. But in heaven, we will know and feel the peace of God in that place and in our being. Because in heaven, there will be a perfect peace with our brothers and sisters, as well as with God. There will be no resentment in heaven, no jealousy, no selfish pride, no thinking of ourselves better than somebody else. There's no anger, no hatred, no criticizing, no condemnation. Just peace. Peace with those who love Jesus. There that peace which passes all understanding in this world will be seen in all its perfection. And one of the greatest things of all is that there will peace with it be, will be within ourselves. Because sometimes we aren't at peace within ourselves, are we? Sometimes we are, we are our worst enemies. We're struggling and, and, and fighting against ourselves. One of my memories uh, of my first year at university, and it's... it's it's, it's, a, it's a sad memory, really, was this, that in the hall of residence in which I was uh, living at the time, there was a, a student, a young man, who had committed suicide. And uh, after he had committed suicide, they found a note that he had written. This is what sticks in my mind when I think about that year. And the note was simply this. I could find no peace. A poor sad person, wasn't he? He couldn't find any peace. The only peace that we can have is a peace with God through believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can get to the point where we're not at peace with ourselves. We chide ourselves, we rebuke ourselves, we punish ourselves, we we bemoan the fact that we're not the believers that we should be or we're not serving the Lord as we ought to be. And we can be restless, and we can be ill-disciplined, and we can be full of anxiety when the Lord Jesus Christ tells us not to be anxious. But there in heaven is a perfect peace. Because heaven is a perfect place where the perfect God is. Another thing we can say about heaven is this, that it is a world of love. It is a world of love. In heaven, when you think about it, when you meditate upon it, you'll know that in heaven is a place of perfect love. In heaven, there'll be a perfect love for us toward God. We will be able to love God perfectly we'll be able to praise God with a perfect love for all his works. His works of creation, his works of salvation. We praise God in love for his rule and his governance over us, that he is our Lord, and yet he's also our Father. But there'll be more. There'll be that perfect love one for another. There'll be nothing in heaven to jar that love. There'll be no irritations, no bad habits, just love. Love for brothers and sisters in Christ. And also, of course, there will be that perfect love for Christ. Loving Jesus for what he did for us, how he died for us. So Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 4 to 5 says this, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In heaven, we will not only know in greater measure the love of God that was poured down upon us, perfect love. But what we can't do this 
then on planet Earth is to give back to God the love that he deserves. But in heaven, we'll be able to love God perfectly. In heaven, we will love perfectly. And then a final point, and it's this, that heaven is a world, a world to long for. Heaven is a world to long for. You know, it's not wrong, well, I'm suggesting to you that we should meditate and think about heaven. It's not lo- wrong to long for heaven. Uh, it's not, long, uh, not wrong to long to be away from the problems and troubles of this life and to be home in heaven with Jesus. Paul, the great apostle, was a man who, uh, well, traversed, I suppose, continents, Europe and Asia, for, for the gospel, didn't he? He was, he was a man who was used of, of God for, for establishing churches, a great soul winner. Yet he longed for heaven. Yet he longed to be with the Lord Jesus. Listen to what Paul has to say in Philippians chapter 1 and verses 21 and 22. Now, perhaps we need to know the context. He's a a prisoner in Rome and he doesn't know whether what happens to him in Rome as a prisoner will be for life or death. But this is what he says. Verse 21, Philippians 1. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do we think like that? Do we think uh, of death and think that death is great gain? Death is the best possible place for me to, to be because when I die, I'll be in heaven and I'll be with Jesus. And Paul goes on to say this, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean, uh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet, what shall I choose? I cannot tell. In fact, he goes on to say that it would be better for them that he would live. But for Paul to be with God in heaven, to be with his Jesus in heaven, was promotion. I think it was the Salvation Army that always talk about promotion, don't they? Promotion to, to glory, promotion to heaven. That's what it is. It is promotion. It's, it's, uh, it's gain, isn't it? Because longings for heaven ought to motivate us for faithful service. Paul's longing for heaven was motivating Paul to write this letter to the Philippian church. It was motivating Paul to say that he still wants to serve God. He still wants to serve Jesus. But if he's not able to do that, if he dies, well, it'll be promotion. And because we know, if we are the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, if because we know Jesus as our Savior and our Lord, and we know that we belong to Jesus, and we know that God is our Father in heaven, and we know that we are citizens of heaven, well, we will also long, won't we, for others. Others who don't yet know the Lord Jesus Christ, We will long for others to come and join with us in heaven where there's no sin, where there is rejoicing in God, where there is the love of God that we are able to give to God for his love towards us in the giving of his son to be our saviour. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we ask and pray that you'd help us to turn our eyes away from the world at times because the world can press in upon us and we have all these images and lots of those images that come upon us are not good. And we realize, Lord, that we are in a world of of sin, a fallen world, but Lord, help us to lift up our eyes unto Jesus and to know him, to be the author and finisher of our faith, but to know also that because we belong to Jesus, then we are your children and heaven is our home and we're just 
sojourners, people who are traveling through life here on this earth. And we long for that time when we will be with you forever and ever. Amen.